All right, I think we are live. Hey, how is it going? It is your muscle building coach, Lee Hayward, with the Total Fitness Bodybuilding video chat for Friday, May the 3rd. And I want to welcome you. If you're brand new to this video chat, please let me know. Type into the video chat window a number one if you are brand new, if this is your first time tuning in to a live video chat. And if you're a regular, you show up to these on a regular basis, put the letter R in the video chat. I'd be interested to just see the, the different groups. How many are brand new? How many are regulars? Please do that. And if you normally catch the replays, put an R in the video chat. So number one, if you're brand new, the letter R if you are, sorry, <laughs> the, le the letter R if you're regular. And what was the other one? Uh, if you normally watch the replays, put an R2 there, R2D2. <laughs> do it that way, R2D2 in the video chat. I just want to get an idea of all the different people who are tuning in and when you normally tune in. So the way these work is I'm going to be hanging out here for the next hour and answering questions and just having a conversation about fitness, nutrition, training, uh, any specific challenges that you may have when it comes to building muscle, burning body fat, uh, motivation, big one especially. Uh, so anything related to fitness, nutrition, getting in shape, losing that gut, and basically performing at your best, feel free to post those in our video chat there, and I'll do my best to help you out over the course of our chat today. And the way this works, there's there's really no such thing as a stupid question. Now, well, I guess there are stupid questions, but even if this is something that you know you think is a basic question, you something that's on your mind, whether it's about working out, whether it's about nutrition, hey, feel free to post it in there. I mean, these video chats are geared mainly towards uh, people who are beginners or people who are coming back to the gym after a layoff. I mean, if, if you've already got your stuff figured out and you're going to the gym on a regular basis, you're already ripped and jacked and whatever. I mean, hey, I invite you to tune in anyway, but that's this chat isn't specifically for people who already got their shit figured out. <laughs> this is for people who need some help in getting their shit figured out. So if that's you, you need some help. Hey, you're, you're come to the right place. So go ahead and post any questions or topics of discussion in our video chat. And like I said, I'll be hanging out here for the next hour and I'll do the best I can to answer those. So I'm just going to get a couple things organized on my end while you're posting in your comments and feedback there. Just a second now. Get this thing underway. All right. Let's see what we got here. Okay, let's so organize my windows. Hopefully the audio is coming through loud and clear. And for those of you who are regular, please let me know in the video chat if the audio is actually coming through better than normal. I hope it is. And the, the reason why I'm hoping this is, is because I think for the last few video chats, and this was something I was unaware of, I was using the, the default audio on my webcam, which is not very good. And this mic, which I bought specifically for doing these video chats, wasn't even selected as the default audio. So uh, hopefully this is coming through loud and clear. Now, even with the past video chats, it was still coming through okay, but it wasn't coming through like crystal clear, if you will. So hopefully it's coming through loud and clear and uh, you can hear me and, and you know, it's better than normal. I, I hope so. I, I'm playing around with the settings here and hopefully I do have it figured out properly this time around. All right. So let's jump into it. Let's see what we got here. We have Sean is joining us. Woodulos is joining us. All right, just going to do a, a bunch of some, all right, some re regulars coming through. All right, coming through loud and clear, loud and clear. Audio's come through good. All right, sound does sound clearer. Thank you, Max. Max mentioned that. All right, I finally got the mic figured out, right? Hopefully it's... Because uh, the video, I mean, it's, it's nice to have a good, sharp video, of course. But in this case, I'm just a talking head. So the main thing is is to have the audio come through loud and clear. All right, let's jump in and uh, bang out as many of these questions as we can over the course of our video chat. So Sean, he's a regular, and he's saying, Lee, what do you think is the best rowing movement for building a freaky thick back? A freaky thick back. Um, bent over rows, bent over barbell rows are one that you can't deny work really well. I mean, former Mr. Olympia, Dorian Yates kind of made that exercise famous. 
uh, his variation of it was the reverse grip bent over row. And it works, you use a curl grip on the barbell and it focuses more on the lower lats and really helps add uh, width and thickness throughout the lats. So that's a good one. And the thing I like about Dorian Yates style of row, which a lot of people refer to as the Yates row, I mean, name it after him, is he didn't bend over excessively at the waist. He kind of kept his body at around a 45 degree angle and really focused on just rowing the elbows back. So it was a shorter range of motion and it placed less stress on the lower back. But again, it really placed a lot of overload on the lats. Now, when you're doing this exercise, it, it doesn't, it, sometimes when you see people doing it, it doesn't look like you're using proper form. Because, I mean, you're not bent over far enough. And some people think you're not going to engage the, engage the lats to a great degree. But just due to the fact of the you're using a lot of overload, a lot of heavy weight, and really uh, placing that emphasis on the lats directly with the rowing movement, it's, it's definitely a good one. So uh, that's one. If I had to pick one main rowing movement, like if... if I know this is kind of stupid when we get these questions, even though I just said there's no such thing as a stupid question. <laughs> but people say, well... You know, if you had to choose one exercise, what would it be or something like that? Well, the good thing is we don't have to choose one exercise. We have a whole gym full of exercises we have access to. But theoretically, if I had to choose one rowing exercise, the bent over barbell row would be that one rowing exercise. All right, let's see what else we got. Let's have a sip of tea before I move on. I've got a turmeric and ginger tea today. Nice, earthy, warm tea and i need it today it's it's freezing out here i was out for a walk earlier today and it's it's around two degrees celsius which for those of you using fahrenheit that's in the in the 30s right it's just above freezing so i mean it's it's cold for for may you know it should be significantly warmer we're getting you know we're well into spring approaching summer we should be moving into warmer temperatures but not not yet for for us here in newfoundland we got a cold windy day today so I need that turmeric ginger tea to warm me up. All right, another question here. This one's, uh, when cutting, should you lower your overall volume because you're in a caloric deficit and your body wouldn't have the energy it needs? All right, um, a lot of people actually use the opposite approach. They try and actually increase the volume in order to burn up more calories. But what you will find when you are in a fat loss cutting phase is your strength will generally go down. Now, you don't purposely try and train lighter. Like this whole idea of uh, light weights and high reps are for cutting and heavy weights and low reps are for bulking. That's not really accurate. And that's that's not how you should train for building muscle or, or losing fat. Uh, but what you will find is when you're in a significant clar cal 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 <laughs> calorie deficit, get my tongue tied here. Blah, 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 blah. When you're in a calorie deficit, you'll find that your strength is going to go down a bit. And it just makes sense. I mean, you don't have as much glycogen in your system. You're not running on as much. And it usually takes a bit of a transition. So in that first month when you start cutting, you're probably really going to feel flat and depleted. After you transition and kind of get used to that lower calorie diet and, and you really get into burning body fat, you will actually find that your strength will start to stabilize after about a month. Right? It'll start to stabilize. And you may even make some new strength gains at this lower calorie intake. And then if you keep dieting and get to the point where now you're starting to transition from lean to ripped, as in like a, a bodybuilder in their final month or so before a competition, that's when you'll find your strength will, will drop off even more. So I'll, I'll use myself as an example. Back when I was competing in bodybuilding, I mean, I've, I've competed in bodybuilding since 1995, done multiple shows during that time. And, and what I would find, the first month was was my transition month. So I would just kind of go through the motions with my, my workouts, with my diet. It was just, the, the first month is, is the worst. And the reason why I say the first month is the worst is because you're losing weight, you're losing strength, and you don't look any different. You're just a smaller version of your, of your old self. And this is what causes a lot of guys to say, I'm losing muscle as soon as they start cutting. They're like, oh, geez, I just dropped 10 pounds and I don't look any leaner. I'm, I'm losing strength. I'm losing muscle. When, no, you're not losing muscle. What you are losing is a lot of 
glycogen, water weight, and just that bloat. And, and having your muscles full of glycogen and just extra water retention and all that does make you feel stronger. Plus, when you're eating a boatload of calories, you have more energy to run on. So in that first month, everyone is going to feel weaker. Everyone's going to lose weight. And you're not going to look significantly better because like, let's just put some numbers out there. Let's say you have 30 pounds to lose and you drop five. You still got 20, you're still 25 pounds overweight. So you're not going to look any different physically. You're not going to look any lean or any more cut or defined, but you're smaller. So that, that causes people to say, oh, I'm losing muscle. When if you just like suck it up, get through that first month, and then you start getting into the in month two and month three and, and, and so on, that's when you'll actually start to see some of the definition and detail starting to show up. Uh, this is assuming you're you're within an average body fat. I mean, if for someone who's 100 pounds overweight, it means it's going to take longer. But, you know, the, the typical, you know, meathead who's in the gym working out and, and just needs to drop, say, 20, 30 pounds in order to get ripped, right? This is the type of thing you're going from. Like, I'm talking about like an off-season bodybuilder transitioning to pre-contest, somewhere in that phase. If, if for those of you who are way overweight, like 100 pounds or more you got to lose, you, you just stretch out the, the timeline a lot longer, obviously. But anyway, I'm just getting back to the topic at hand. Uh, month two, month three, you're really going to start to notice, okay, your, your, your strength will probably stabilize and you'll start to lose weight and actually see some improvements in your physique, meaning that, oh, now I'm starting to see some, some definition, maybe a bit more vascularity and a bit more lines, especially in your arms and legs for guys. I mean, it, it's easier to see definition in the upper body, meaning the chest, arms, shoulders, and also in the legs, the, the quadriceps and the calves. That midsection, that belly roll, right? That's always the last part to go. So that's the, that's the stubborn area for, for most guys. And you, usually you're going to have to diet for a few months or, or maybe even longer in order to really get into burning that stubborn belly fat, right? That's the, the pesky nuisance fat, right? I, I've known a lot of guys who've, you know, they could have ripped definition throughout the chest, arms, shoulders. You know, they could have separation in their quads. They could have, you know, look really good everywhere else. But then they lift up their shirt and they got that stubborn roll of belly fat. So that's just the way it is. You just need to diet longer in order to tap into burning that stubborn belly fat. Now, for, for, for the ladies who are joining us, if, if we do have any ladies, I know 90% of my followers are male. But I do have that 10% of females who follow my videos. So if you're one of those 10% females, I welcome you to the chat. Uh, always nice to have that balance. But you'll find that the, the stubborn body fat is from the waist down. So the upper body, the chest, shoulders, arms, even the stomach for a lot of women, you can lose that relatively easily. But then the waist down, the hips and the thighs especially, that is the stubborn fat. And I've seen a lot of female uh, bodybuilders and figure competitors, and bikini competitors and all that who've dieted down, and sometimes it looks like they have two different body types connected at the waist. You know, they can be shredded from the waist up and then soft and even have cellulite from the waist down. I mean, it's, it's kind of weird how the body works, but that's that's just the way it is. Guys, you know, you could have, you know, ripped shoulders and arms, ripped legs, and you could have a belly roll hanging over your, your belt, right? I mean, that's, again, the way it works. So when it comes to losing that stubborn body fat, you really need to diet longer, not so much diet harder. And to kind of put some realistic numbers, when I was getting ready for competition, in order for me to get ripped, because when I started, I used to do the traditional 12-week diet, right, thinking that was long enough. And if you're already lean to begin with, then 12 weeks may be enough. But if you got a bit extra weight to lose, 12 weeks is usually not going to cut it. So what I found is in my case, where I'm not a naturally lean person, I struggle to lose body fat. Uh, it took me six months to get ready for a competition. So six months to go from chubby to contest shredded. And that was pretty standard. If if I wanted to get in shape, that's how long it took. So just to put those numbers in perspective, if, if you're of average body fat now and you want to get shredded, you know, give yourself six months. It's going to take that long. If you got a lot more to lose, it's probably going to take 12 months or longer. Again, it all depends on the individual. And if you would like some some help with this and some, you know, maybe some guidelines of what you should do and how to go about it, we can brainstorm this. Uh, just send me an email, leeh at leehayward.com or just head on over to my website, leehayward.com and uh, send me a message there and we can uh, brainstorm, have a strategy session and come up with some uh, action plans that are right for you. All right, let's move on. Okay. 
We have Woodulos is joining us. UDUCFUL is joining us. Woodulos says, greetings from a cold Scotland. I think we probably got the same weather over here on the other side of the pond here in Newfoundland. It's a cold one today as well. Um, how do you know when it's time to wear a whiff? Oh, how do you know when it's time to wear a whiff? <laughs> a weightlifting belt. I, I, that's from Woodulos. How do you know when it's time to wear a weightlifting belt? Uh, first off, if you're brand new to training, don't even bother, right? If, if you're within even your first year of training, I wouldn't even bother with a belt. Just focus on building up your, your natural strength, your core strength, everything. If you're more advanced, intermediate to advanced, and you're doing squats, overhead presses, uh, heavy rows, things of that nature where, where your lower back comes into play, that's when you can use a belt on your heavy sets. And it, it's optional. I mean, you even I know some advanced people still don't wear belts, right? It's kind of optional personal preference. But what you'll find is when you wear a good belt, it will help to stabilize your core and give you more strength in those exercises where your core is a weak link. So for example, a squat, right? You got a loaded barbell on your back, your core is connecting your body together, right? You're connecting your upper body and your lower body. You need to have that strong, stable core. The weightlifting belt will do that. Deadlifts, it'll help to stabilize your back again, give you that strong core. Overhead presses, rows, all those exercises, uh, that's where the belt will come into play. The way I recommend using it is save it for your heavy working sets. So your light warm-up weight sets, there's there's no need to wear a belt unless you're just getting used to it. If, if you're brand new to a belt and you want to learn the belt, learn how it feels and get, get comfortable, then yeah, fine. Use it for all your sets just to get comfortable with it. But for when you are comfortable with the belt and you know how it feels and, and, and how the support works and all that, only save it for your heavy sets. So, for example, I, I did a leg workout last night where I did squats. And for, for my warm-up sets, I didn't use the belt. When I got up to my he heavy working weight sets, that's when I put the belt on. And it makes a noticeable difference. You will feel stronger. You will be able to lift more weight and feel more secure with that belt. Um, as far as the type of belt, I recommend a thick powerlifting style belt. And I, I don't have my belt with me. It's actually down in my basement gym. But... Uh, the belts that I recommend are the thick ones that are about four inches wide all around. And these are, are typically powerlifting or weightlifting belts and not the bodybuilding belts that you see at the department stores, right? You go into your, your generic department store, or maybe even you see them at the, the gym that you train at. These bodybuilding belts that are really wide in the back and then really thin and tiny up front. They, they still offer some support, but it's not as much support as the one that is four inches all the way around. Because with the belt, you want to have that thickness up front so that you can actually push your stomach into the belt and draw the belt tight around your core. A lot of these bodybuilding belts that are really thick in the back and really thin in the front, they, they're, they're actually too thick in the back, providing too much uh, belt in the back and not enough in the front. So... There's a reason why you'll see power lifters and weight lifters using the, the type of belts they do, and that's because those are the most effective. So if you are getting a belt, get yourself a proper power lifting slash weight lifting belt, not one of these, you know, cheap department store bodybuilding belts. Uh, if, you know, if you're going to do it, do it right and save it for your heavy working sets. All right. Good questions. Moving on. All right, Sean's got another one saying, Lee, can you help me come up with a more strategic workout plan? Size and strength are the goal. Uh, yes, but I want a phenomenal cosmic powers. I want supernatural capabilities and control over time and space. Uh, Sean is, is living out of a comic book. Um, <laughs> go watch the Avengers or something like that. It's, it's follow an Avengers workout. I'm sorry, dude. I, I can help you with a workout plan, but as far as cosmic powers... I'm still working on my cosmic powers as we speak. So when I figure it out, I'll let you know. All right. Mohammed is joining us. This is Mr. Lee. I am Mohammed, 32 years old. I want to ask about the best training routine while dry fasting. Is it body split, total body, or just come back to the gym for, from a long rest? All right. Based on your name and based on the fact that you're asking about dry fasting, I'm assuming you're talking about Ramadan. 
correct me if I'm wrong, but I would, if I was a gambling man, I would bet that you're talking about Ramadan because I've been doing this since 1997 and every single year I get questions about Ramadan and how do you go about training during Ramadan? I've never went through a dry fast before. I've experienced, I've done some personal experiments with water fasting and water fasting is totally different than dry fasting. Uh, if you were just doing water fasting, I'd say, I mean, water fasting in, in the case of this would just be like normal intermittent fasting, right? There'd be no issue at all. But the dry component of limiting your water intake, that makes it more challenging, especially when you're looking at fitness and performance, because when your body is dehydrated, your strength goes down, your energy goes down, your, your work capacity goes down, and it's, you know, it, it places some stress on the body, right? I mean, when you, when you are in a dehydrated state. So you want to be very careful. And th the best advice I can give you, I mean, the, the, if you're going to strictly follow Ramadan and go through it, there's really nothing you can do to cancel out the effects of the fast. What I'd recommend is you purposely just scale back the intensity of your workouts and, and use it almost like a deload phase where you're still going to work out. You're still going to keep yourself active, but you're not going to push yourself to the max intensity because your body is, is not, you're not feeding your body properly. It's not going to be able to recover the same and you're, it's, it's just kind of pointless to, uh, you know, put the pedal to the metal when you, you have you no know, suboptimal fuel in the tank, right? So it doesn't make sense. So treat it like a deload phase. It would be a great time to focus on fat loss. So, I mean, you could probably keep yourself in a caloric uh, deficit, which wouldn't be that hard to do when you're doing an intermittent fasting approach like that. And, and just during the daytime hours when you're not allowed to eat or drink, purposely keep your activity level low. I mean, what I would recommend if you, if you are going to work out is try and do the workouts either first thing in the morning after you've had some food and, and fluid in you or later in the evening after dark when you can have some food and fluid as well. So try and avoid doing like a lot of activity midday when you are depleted on food and also depleted on fluid and you have no, you're not allowed to replenish it. Right? That's that's just going to set you up for even more dehydration. So try and uh, like if, if you're going to work out first thing in the morning, have yourself you know a, a good uh, fuel up on water, get some lots of fluid in your system first beforehand, and that'll help to uh, give you better energy throughout your workout. If you're going to do it later in the day, slam back at least a liter of water before you go to the gym so that you rehydrate your body. That's the big thing. The the calories restriction. I, I, not such a big thing, but the water and not just water, but sodium and potassium and magnesium, get those electrolytes in there as well. And I actually have a YouTube video talking about pre and pre-workout electrolytes. If you want to go check that out, just do a search for Lee Hayward electrolytes and you should find it. But th this becomes even more important whenever you're doing intermittent fasting and especially if you're doing dry fasting. So hopefully this helps again. It's only for a month, right? You know, it's, it's, it's just a, a one month deload fat loss type of phase. Think of it that way. And then after it's done, then you can get back to your regular training and resume things as normal. And the good thing about it is if you do lose any muscle over Ramadan, it's not a big deal. You can always regain it afterwards. It's easier to regain lost muscle than it is to gain it in the first place. So, you know, muscle memory is a real thing. So, if, if you find that your performance suffers, you know, don't, don't stress out over it. Don't, don't let that worry you because as soon as you get back to normal eating, normal training and all that afterwards, within a month, you'll probably be back to your previous level of strength and then, you know, setting new personal records after that. So again, don't, don't stress it out, you know, embrace it for what it is, right? It's a, you know, a, a spiritual cleanse, if you will, and, and use it for that. All right, let's move on. We have UDU Seafull. I, I, again, I don't know how you pronounce that username, but he says he's out for a walk as he listens and learns from this chat. Good for you, man. I pr good for you. That, that's good. You're getting getting some you know, education and, and physical activity at the same time. Okay. Uh, Carnage Maximum saying, Lee, what are the benefits of box squats versus free squats? Box squats. This is something I'm actually doing in my own training right now. So it's, it's ironic that you just mentioned this, but I'm, I'm using box squats as part of my workout. And the most recent workout of the month program that's over on the Total Fitness Bodybuilding Inner Circle actually incorporates box squats. So 
maybe maybe that's where you're, the, the question comes from if you're a member of the inner circle and you're asking about box squats. Um, the difference between a box squat and a regular squat is the box squat breaks up the eccentric and concentric chain. So it breaks up the positive and the negative. So you're, you're literally pausing momentarily on the box. And this takes the momentum out of the exercise. So for example, like if, if you're doing deadlifts and you pause the barbell on the floor in between each rep, it's a lot harder to do the deadlift that way versus if you either keep the barbell off the floor or you kind of bounce it off the floor, like some people do, like they just keep that almost like a piston, you know, going with when they're pumping out reps. So pausing on a box breaks up that eccentric concentric chain and it makes the exercise a stricter squat variation. And it's also better for building that explosive starting strength coming up out of the bottom. Another benefit of box squats is you can squat with different technique. Like a lot of times when people do box squats, they probably will squat with a wider stance, sitting back further than they normally would if they were doing free squats. And you can manipulate where you place some of the emphasis. So for example, if you have knee problems, sometimes doing a, a wider stance box squat and sitting further back on a box will allow you to squat without aggravating the knees because you're actually placing some of the workload off the knees and placing more of it on the hips and glutes and hamstrings. So it, it, you can change up the, the variations of the squat. And also it, it's good for teaching the squat because it keeps the, uh, the depth consistent, right? You squat until you sit on the box. And of course, ideally you would have some sort of setup where you can adjust the height. So you start off with a high box. As you get more experienced and you build up your flexibility and your mobility, you can gradually lower the height of the box. So it's, there's a lot of benefits to it, right? It's, it's a, a very powerful exercise especially when it comes to building up strength. And what I found myself when I was started using box squats first, and this was back in the, oh, when did I, I started using box squats back in the early 2000s. This was, I, I heard about them from following the West Side Barbell, uh, you know, watching all the Louis Simmons VHS tapes. And of course, there are huge advocates of box squatting. So I, I started implementing box squats for myself and uh, I found that, not only did I get stronger with the squats, but it made my deadlift go up like crazy. Because before I started doing box squats, the most I could deadlift was in that 405 range. Like maybe on a good day, I get like 415 or 420, but I was always four plates. Four plate deadlift was the most I could ever pull. No more than that. And I remember I, I did like a three month phase of box squats and I didn't even deadlift during that three month phase. And then I went back and tried deadlifts uh, after three months of box squatting. And I immediately pulled 500 easy, five plates aside. I was blown away and I didn't even deadlift during that time. It was all strength that I had built from box squatting. So it, it's really good for building up that explosive starting strength, which you need if you're doing a deadlift off the floor. So it's a good exercise for, for strengthening that as well. I mean, like I said, we can go on and on. There's like Louis Simmons has got like, uh, maybe like a two hour VHS tape talking about box squats. And even that is only scratching the surface, right? It's, it's a powerful exercise, bottom line. And it's actually one of the exercises that's in the, uh, the workout of the month program over on the total fitness bodybuilding inner circle. All right. Jesse is joining us and he's a regular to the show. We, all right. Neil's joining us regular to the show. Rang is joining us. He says, uh, he says, please, um, can, can we push, sorry, please kind of can, can push ups for mass to strength on a daily basis. Okay. English isn't the first language here, but you're doing a darn good job. Uh, so you're asking basically is push. Can you do push ups for mass and strength on a daily basis? Yeah, you can. You can do push-ups for, for, on a daily basis, and it's a great uh, way to really speed up growth in the chest, shoulders, and triceps. Um, back when, before I really got into bodybuilding, I was doing a lot of bodyweight exercises, push-ups and squats and pull-ups and, and things like that, because I was really focusing on martial arts. And in martial arts training, we did a lot of bodyweight exercises, and I used to do them on a daily basis. And that's one of the things that really gave my chest a head start or... or, or a jump start, if you will, on a lot of my other body parts in terms of development. I really helped to fill out my chest and it was all related to doing daily push-ups. And even now, if, if I'm coaching somebody and a chest 
the chest is a stubborn body part, I will have them do daily push-ups. So it, it really doesn't matter how you split it up. It's just you want to do them on a daily basis to pump blood and circulation and nutrients into that muscle on a regular basis. And the more often you can pump up a muscle, the more often you can get that blood flow and, and, and nutrients in there, uh, the better it's going to be for building growth. So uh, yeah, push-ups on a daily basis are great. The thing is you want to do them with limited volume, right? Like I wouldn't recommend doing it to the point where you're painfully sore, but just do a little pump up, like a little daily pump up, maybe do a set or two of push-ups in the morning, a set or two of push-ups in the evening, and do that in addition to your workouts at the gym. So these little frequent pump ups, just getting more blood flow, more circulation, more nutrients into the muscle, creating more mind muscle connection, you know, because the more often you do this, the more you're, you're going to start to feel your chest working and you're going to get a better pump and, and get that mind muscle connection. And that'll carry over into your workouts at the gym. So when you're doing your bench presses and your flies and your dips and cable crossovers and pec deck and whatever else you're doing, you will actually feel your chest working and, and getting a better pump doing those exercises if you're doing push-ups on a daily basis as well. So if your chest is a stubborn body part, uh, try it. Try for the next 30 days. Do a set or two of push-ups each morning, another set or two each night, in addition to your workouts that you're doing at the gym. And I bet within 30 days, you will notice an improvement in the level of fullness and, and, and development in your chest. All right, let's move on. We have Max joining us. Jason's joining us. We got regulars to the show. A lot of regulars. That's awesome. Okay, and we have, hey, it's Hunter87 saying the fastest way to grow the biceps. I would actually use a strategy similar to what I just mentioned with the push-ups, just apply it to the biceps. Regular curls throughout the, like you do set in the morning, set in the evening, and just regularly pumping up uh, the biceps on a regular basis. And you could do this, if you have a set of dumbbells, you can do that. If you have rubber resistance bands, that's great as well. And this is something, again, just get that frequent blood flow and stimulation into the arms. And in fact, that's one of the uh, the uh, exercises that's in the Blast Your Biceps program. If you want to go check that out, it's blastyourbiceps.com. That's a bicep specialization program that I've put together. But one of the exercises from there is doing uh, daily rubber band curls. So you take a rubber resistance band, the tubing, and you just do high repetition curls on a daily basis to pump up your arms. That's phase one of the program is you do that along with the other body part workouts just to get that frequent blood flow and stimulation in there. Then we get into the more advanced uh, training split where we utilize positions of flexion and, and you know, different angles and heavy and light uh, training days. So, you know, it's, it's a complete three phase system, but phase one is just the, uh, high volume rubber band curls on a daily basis. And that's what I would recommend you start with if you want to speed up growth in the biceps for the same reasons that I just mentioned for the push-ups. More blood flow, more nutrients, more circulation on a regular basis. And it's just going to help to uh, speed up growth in those stubborn body parts. 80s baby, 90s kid strong says, what advice would you have for people who are defenseless against junk food and soda because I'm one of them. All right, that's a mental block more than anything. Because everybody has control. I mean, now don't get me wrong. I, I realize that junk food and soda has addictive properties to it. And that's that's been as established, right? I mean, like sugar is like the new crack. <laughs> you know, it's 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 addictive. Sugar is addictive. Absolutely it is. So but at the same time, you do have a choice, right? You do have a choice. And what I would recommend is for someone in that situation, um, like say, I really need to know more about the, the context and your overall diet and everything else. So, I mean, it, this is kind of like generic advice that I'm giving here. I mean, if you would like to actually talk about this one-on-one -on -one and in private, because I mean, there's probably deeper issues going on. Like there's, there's mental issues a lot of times when people have eating disorders, or, or, or food addictions and things like that. So, you know, maybe we're not going to get into that here on this video chat, but if you would like to discuss this offline, if you will, hey, feel free to email me, leeh at leehayward.com, and we can brainstorm some strategies that are specific to you and your, your specific challenges. But I'm just going to kind of give a generic answer right here. Um, 
what I would recommend for people who are struggling with eating junk food is don't so much focus on trying to cut out the junk food. Like this is, you see this a lot. Like people say, oh, I'm going to go on a diet and I'm going to cut out carbs and I'm going to cut out this. I'm going to cut out soda. I'm going to cut out junk food. I'm going to cut out, cut out, cut out. And when you cut things out of your diet, how does that make you feel? Just think of it. How, how do you feel when you give something up? Right? You feel deprived. You feel like there's a void. Right? You don't feel good. There's a void left. Right? You're, you're taking something out. So what I recommend instead is let's do a reverse psychology and let's focus on filling up on the good stuff. So instead of taking out the bad stuff, let's fill up on the good stuff. So every single meal, let's put in a good quality serving of protein. Let's put in a good quality serving of vegetables. Let's focus on fresh fruit. Let's focus on good quality complex carbohydrates. Let's focus on filling up on all that good high nutrient dense foods. And then by default, you have less room for the junk foods and the sodas and whatever else. Like with your meals, instead of drink, instead of focusing on cutting up the soda, just drink more water. You know, instead of focusing on cutting up the junk food, eat more vegetables and purposely, you know, it's going to take a bit of willpower, right? It's going to take some of that, but fo focus on filling up on the good stuff. And then what you'll find is as you make that switch, and it's, it's not going to be instant, but this is something that's going to take place over the course of several weeks and even several months. But as you more consistently make those choices and gradually make that switch, you're going to start to actually crave the good stuff and have less desire for the bad stuff right? It's again, it's not going to be some instant magical switch. It's not like you're going to do that this weekend. And, you know, by Monday, your, your junk food cravings are gone, right? It's, it doesn't happen that quick. It's going to take, you know, literally, you know, a couple months or more for this transition to actually happen. But if you stick to what I'm saying, it will happen. And then you'll look back at this, you know, a few months down the road and say, well, you know, I used to be really addicted to whatever pizza and soda and cake and cookies and crisps. And, but now actually, you know, I actually look forward to uh, eating good, healthy food, and, and you will. I mean, that's that's where I'm to now. I mean, like when it comes to vegetables and, and protein and, and, you know, good quality nutrient-dense foods, I actually crave that stuff, right? That's what I want. I mean, and yes, I will have some junk food occasionally, but I, I don't get much satisfaction from it. it. It's weird. Like sometimes I'll eat it and I'm like, Meh. you know, I thought it was going to be better than it was, right? You know? And then when I actually eat it, I kind of like feel like crap afterwards. But if I eat the good stuff, I feel good afterwards. So you'll start to crave the good stuff and crave that good feeling that good food gives you. And you'll gra you know, gradually push yourself away, away from craving the junk food. But do it in that sense. And this can apply to other addictions. Like even if you're addicted to smoking, instead of constantly thinking of, of kidding, quitting smoking, think of filling that void with something else. So, for example, if you normally go out for a cigarette break, uh, at, you know, at work, think of going out for a walk break instead. So fill that void with something else. Okay? Go outside and just breathe fresh air and walk for 10 minutes rather than standing on the corner of the building and sucking on a cancer stick for 10 minutes. Right. Just f try to fill the void. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll be honest. I mean, back when I was in high school, I went through a phase where I got in with the wrong crowd. And I, I went through a phase where I started smoking cigarettes. Now, it's it's not a big deal in the greater scheme of things, but it's, it's kind of like that gateway to potentially worse things. So I was in junior high, actually, and I was smoking cigarettes, and I did it for a full year. And of course, you know, I wasn't old enough to legally smoke or anything else, but I still did it and got the cigarettes off other students at school and whatever. But bottom line, I did that for a full year. So I understand the, the challenges that people who, who go through smoking have because I, you know, I was a smoker. I was, you know, I got hooked on it from a young age, but how I got out of it was instead of focusing on quitting the smoking, I was, that's the same time that I started getting into working out and bodybuilding. And I realized that the smoking had a negative impact on my bodybuilding. So I literally trade the, the cigarettes for fitness and I created that negative association. So, you know, the cigarettes are hindering my ability to perform well in fitness. I'm not able to keep up with everybody else because of the cigarettes, right? These other guys, they have more endurance. They're stronger. They're making better gains. I'm falling behind because of these goddamn cigarettes. Excuse the French. So I use that as my to, to transition. I fill that void with something healthier versus instead of saying, I just want to quit sm smoking. 
like again, just trying to give something up rarely works. You have to fill that void with something more powerful and more valuable. And if you do that, then you'll be much more successful in the long run. So hopefully that makes sense. And again, if, if you would like to discuss this in more detail and come up with a you know a real action plan that's that's right for you, send me an email and I'll be more than happy to uh, to discuss this with you. You know, we can have a, a brainstorm strategy session, if you will. All right, let's move on. Uh, UDUC full saying, uh, you're doing great. Good, clean content, no foul language. And I actually use the foul language. I do apologize. I don't normally say foul language unless I uh, get passionate. It wasn't that foul. I mean, I did say GD, but I try to keep it clean. I don't, I, I don't like, I don't like using foul language. And, and especially now that I've got a, you know, a two-year-old son at home, I definitely don't want to be using foul language. I don't want him to learn those words from me, right? I know he's going to learn them eventually, but Definitely don't want them to be learning from me. I just personally don't like it. All right, we have uh, Luz is joining us, or uh, she's one of our coaching students, and she's saying, "What are your thoughts and advice on eating disorders?" Okay, this is very similar, and people that are in recovery from restricting their calories for too long. I basically just covered that exact same question with the one before, um, and I'm just going to kind of refer you back to that previous question. If you have an eating disorder, don't focus on quitting the, the bad foods. Focus on filling the void with the good stuff. And again, if you, if you would like to discuss this, you know, send me a message and we can, you know, hop on Skype or hop on Zoom or hop on the phone and actually, uh, you know, plan out a, a strategy session that's that's right for you. All right. But yeah, that that's, that's huge because uh, when it comes to like eating disorders, I mean, most people know what they should do, but it's doing what they know. And that's the hard part. It's, it's like you don't need another diet plan, right? You don't need another workout plan. You can go on the Internet and you can type into Google, whatever, workout program, diet plan, go on YouTube, type it in. There, there's hundreds, there's thousands, there's, I don't know, there might be millions, right? There, like you don't need another diet plan, right? What you need is you need a system in place that allows you to do what you already know you should do. And that's where the challenge comes in. It's not, you know, the, the latest and the greatest and, oh, what, what are my macros and all this kind of stuff. I mean, I'm not saying that that stuff doesn't matter. It does at the higher level when you're already doing everything you know you should be and you're trying to, like a, a competitor who's trying to peak for competition or, you know, they're already doing everything right. They just want to maximize it now. But for the person who's out of shape and overweight and not doing everything right, they don't need to worry about, you know, what's the right macro ratio and blah, blah, blah to hit my peak. They just need to get in base level shape to begin with. And, and that's usually a mental block more so than a how to not knowing what to do. Most people that I work with know what they should do. It's just they can't get themselves to do what they know. And that's where, you know, they need some help. Right. So if again, if, if that's you, send me a message and we can chat. All right, Mohammed saying thanks for the help, Mr. Lee. You're very welcome. Glad to uh, help you. And again, hopefully you find this beneficial. Fair Dinkum, I think it is, uh, from Australia is joining us. He says, uh, Neil's joining us. Saying it's coming through loud and clear. Good. Justin's joining us. Maximilian's joining us. Uh, do, 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 do. Let's see. Coming through great. In Australia. Boynaj says he left a like. I appreciate it. If, if you like this video chat, please smash that like button and let me know. If you don't like this video chat, smash the dislike button and let me know. All right? Post your comments and, and your likes or dislikes and give me some feedback. I'm open to feedback and constructive criticism. You know, if there's something you'd like to see that you're not currently seeing, let me know. And if there's something you really like, then let me know and I'll try and do more of it. All right, Jesse's saying, any tips to improve my deadlift? I went from 365 for five to 390 for five, but when I attempt 395, it's a bit of a challenge. Thanks as always. Okay, well, first off, you you put 25 pounds in your deadlift, which is really good, right? I mean, you know, don't knock progress. That's that's really good. Um, I mean, maybe that's, you're just currently at that plateau, meaning that's as far as you can progress at this current stage of development. But there's a lot of things that you can do to improve your deadlift. Um, one that I mentioned earlier in the chat, the box squats. 
that was the single best exercise that made the biggest jump in my deadlift. I didn't see anything that could add pounds to my deadlift more than the box squat. So if you haven't done box squats, on your marching orders for the next few months is to incorporate box squats. Uh, if, if you haven't, and, you know, some other exercises that are helpful as well, like power rack lockouts, right? That's really good for overloading the deadlift. Uh, farmer's walk, you know, it's a, a similar type of movement, but it's, it's the same thing, only different, if that makes sense. You know, that's another good assistant exercise. Hyperextensions, right? Lots of high rep hyperextensions just to build up, you know, the posterior chain, the hamstrings, the glutes, and the lower back. I mean, that's another phenomenal one. Good mornings, right? There's a lot of things that you can do. And also the way that you train your deadlift. Like a lot of people do high repetition deadlifts and high reps is not the way to build maximum strength in the deadlift. If you want to build maximum strength, you want to focus on multiple sets of low reps. And if you would like an actual deadlift workout, go to Google and type in Lee Hayward seven week deadlift workout, or just head over to my website, leehayward.com and type in, in this, there's a search bar there. Type in Lee Hayward seven week deadlift workout, seven week deadlift workout. And this is a progressive training system using multiple sets of low reps. And when I say low reps, it's actually multiple sets of single reps. So we're not doing sets of five or sets of three or sets of eight to 10 or anything. We're doing sets of one. And the reason why we're doing multiple sets of one is because we're building technique. We're building that explosive strength. And that's that's one of the best ways to really increase a max deadlift. So again, do a search for that. Uh, and, you know, that could definitely put you on the right track. But I know I gave you a lot of things that you could incorporate, right? You know, the box squats, the deadlift program, the, is the different special exercises, right? There's a lot of things you can do. But pick one of them. Don't get overwhelmed and do nothing. Just pick one of them. So if you're really stuck, maybe just uh, do box squats and that seven-week deadlift program, right? Just Just do that much. Don't make it any more complicated than that. Because that's one of the problems is sometimes people get too much information and they get overwhelmed and they don't, they don't do anything, right? Like you Google search how to lose weight and then you see, you know, 5 million search results and, and you know, 25 different diet plans and, you know, everybody's saying do this and do that and you get overwhelmed and you don't do anything, right? You just got to kind of pick one thing, stick to it and make it work, right? And, and sometimes, you know, it's knowledge is like accumulation, right? There's, we have infinite knowledge out there, right? We're accumulating all this stuff, but wisdom is elimination, right? You know, a wise man eliminates all the crap that you don't need and just focuses on the essentials that you do need. And that's what you really need to do when it comes to your fitness is just to put on your blinders, eliminate the crap that you don't need and focus on those few things that are actually going to move the needle and help you move yourself in the right direction towards your fitness goals. All right. Another sip of ginger turmeric tea. Almost almost had a tea here, guys. When the tea is gone, the show has to end. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see what else we got. Uh, Hunter's asking again about the biceps question. We already answered that one. Maximilian, in a bulk, how many pounds should I look to gain in a week? Also, when cutting, how many pounds should I aim to lose? Bulking is generally a slower process than cutting. Generally, right? I mean, it's going to vary from person to person, but in a generic terms, bulking a pound a week max, maybe even half a pound to one pound a week, whereas cutting, you can look for one to two pounds a week. If you're really overweight, you can cut more, right? Like someone who's got 100 pounds to lose is going to be able to cut weight faster and lose more than someone who's got 25 pounds to lose, Right, you know, it just makes sense. If you, the more weight you got to lose, the the, the faster you can can lose it. Uh, but for those are some good g generic numbers that you could start with. Right, when you're bulking, if you can gain two to four pounds a month of quality mass, that's good. That's good progress. I mean, you may gain more, especially if you're just starting out. But once you get in into a consistent routine, uh, that's that's those are some good numbers that you can settle on and try and really you know strive to hit those numbers month after month. When it comes to fat loss, uh, one to two pounds per week uh, is a good number to shoot for. And again, that's after the initial phase, right? That initial, the initial month of bulking and cutting, things are going to happen faster. And that's mostly just due to water weight. 
Like when you follow a high calorie diet and you're eating more carbohydrates, your body's going to retain more water. So you may gain faster, but it's mostly just glycogen and water retention. Vice versa, when you start cutting, you lose that glycogen, you lose that water retention, so you may lose faster. But once you get past that first month, right, that first month is just your transition month. Kind of like just go through the motions for the first month. Don't even worry about the number on the scale or whatever. Just kind of like put your blinders on and just go get that first month out of the way. And then month two is when you're actually going to start making some progress, right? That's where you're, you're really going to start building some lean muscle or burning some body fat is month two on, right? The first month, don't even, don't even worry about what happens on the scale because it's, it's just mostly water weight anyway. Uh, but once you get into it, that's when you're going to see uh, those numbers. <clears throat> All right, let's see what else we have. Lee, what do you think about a 60-year-old man who feels 30, who used to bodybuild when younger, but notice muscle memory and have a good pump? Let me read that again. Lee, what do you think about a 60-year-old man who feels 30, who used to bodybuild when he was younger, but notice muscle have memory and I get a good pump? Well... If you still feel 30, good for you. I mean, hey, that, that's awesome. I hope to feel 30 when I get 60, right? I mean, it'd be awesome if 60 is the new 30 and you can just feel young and full of piss and vinegar and all kinds of energy as you get older. I mean, that's that's what I want to do. I'm hoping to do that. Uh, but, I mean, as for, let's, let's just be realistic here. I mean, you, Chances are you're probably not going to build the same level of muscle as you did when you were in your 30s, right? You know, it's just, it's, it's physically impossible. I mean, you look at any bodybuilder who used to be in great shape and that now that they're older, they don't have the same physique, right? It's, it's even the guys who are willing to do whatever it takes. Like, let's, I'm not saying they don't have a good physique, but they don't have the same level of physique, right? Like, um, even look at some of the famous guys like Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? I mean, you know, he's, up there now and he doesn't have the same physique as he did when he was mr olympia you know sylvester stallone right he's he's still in great shape but not the same physique as when he was rocky right you know it's not the same and it's just age does take its toll but with proper training nutrition and proper lifestyle choices you can make the most of that and you can you know if, if you follow a proper program you can be in awesome shape at 60 years old much better than the average 60 year old who's you know old fat and out of shape and just sitting around waiting to die for lack of a better word i mean the other day i was at the gym and i, I met a gentleman who was 71 now he wasn't ripped or jacked or anything like that but he was in damn good shape for 71 he was lean he was fit I mean, he looked young in the face. I mean, yeah, he had gray hair, but he looked young and he, you know, had a big smile on his face and he was energetic and he came over and, you know, we just started having some chit chat between sets like you would. And, but I mean, he, he looked youthful, he looked youthful and he had energy. And I'm like, man, you're, you're 71 and you're looking freaking good. Right. I mean, I, I was impressed and I use that as like a role model because most people that age, they're sitting on their asses and doing nothing. Whereas this guy is out to the gym, right. Keeping himself active. And he also mentioned some of his other hobbies. Like he, he goes rollerblading, right? And I'm like, how, how many 71 year olds do you see putting on a pair of roller skates and hitting the, you know, going out and rollerblading? I mean, it's awesome. So, man, like if you feel energetic and you want to do it, then age is just a number. Do it, right? Man, I mean, so again, kudos to you, right? Milk it for what it's worth. All right, George is joining us. He says, how can I get ripped eating anything I want? You can't. <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> Seriously, I mean, you, you can't. You have, to, you have to control. You can't out-train a bad diet unless you are just one of these genetic freaks who has a racing fast metabolism, right? And, and if, if you are that, then you wouldn't be asking this question in the first place. But you can't eat garbage and get ripped, right? You know, like... The old adage, you are what you eat, it's, it's not literally true, but there's some good correlations there, right? Garbage in, garbage out. All right, moving on, we have Ryan joining us. He says, Lee, you said that you hit a new per P PR using blood flow restriction training. Um, did you quit using them? I, I, I slacked off using them, but I actually got myself a proper set of blood flow restriction armbands. And um, again, they're down in my basement home gym, but uh, 
I, I bought them online and they're proper bands that you can actually snap into place and, and have the proper tension. You know, they're, they're elastic bands, almost like an, a knee wrap or a wrist wrap, but it has a, a clamp on it where you can adjust the, uh, the tension. Because before I was literally using a rubber band and a heavy duty rubber band and, and tying off my arms. And that was a bit of a nuisance. But I went ahead and, and bought the proper set of blood flow restriction uh, armbands, and it, I've used them a few times. And I still, the, the way I use them now is like when I'm at the gym training and during my normal workouts, I typically don't do any blood flow restriction training because it does limit your strength. Like you're not going to be able to lift as heavy and push yourself as hard when you do have the, the blood flow restriction, but you will get a better pump. So what I sometimes do is let's say I'm, I'm pressed for time and I don't, you know, I'm scheduled to do a workout today, but for whatever reason, you know, sh shit gets busy. Life gets busy, you know, and, and this, this week has been a prime example of that. I've had some hectic week because my poor little baby son, he, uh, he got a stomach bug and we actually had to take him to the hospital because he was throwing up and couldn't keep any food in. And that went on for several days. So he's all right. He's doing much better now, uh, if, if you're wondering, but, um, Still, that was stressful and, and, you know, just kind of threw my schedule off a loop. So instead of going to the gym and doing my regular workouts, I was actually doing a few blood flow restriction training workouts at home. You know, I just usually half hour tops, boom, go in there, pump up the arms with the blood flow restriction. And I did measure my arms. And when they're pumped, they did just shy of 18 inches was what they were when I measured them. And again, that's that's a personal best for me. So, I mean, you do get a really killer pump using the blood flow restriction, but it's not something that I use on a regular basis. You know, when I'm doing my heavy barbell lifts and, and things like that, I don't like to have any blood flow restriction because it will limit your strength in those lifts. And it, it may also hinder some of your technique. Like if you're trying to do bench presses and overhead presses and whatever with, with blood flow restriction bands, it's, it's not going to be the same. So I just save them for like a little arm pump up and I might throw that in, you know, few times a month, just, just for shits and giggles, more or less, right? It's just a, a fun extra workout that I like to do. All right, Jeffrey's joining us. Uh, let's see what else we have. Mohammed's joining us. He says, uh, my chest is not even. How can I make it even with dumbbells at home? Thanks a lot. Your videos are amazing. Um, first off, if you have an imbalance in your body parts, you know, one pec is bigger than the other, one arm's bigger than the other, one leg's bigger than the other, one shoulder's bigger than the other, whatever. Rest assured, this is pretty common. In fact, I'd be willing to bet that 99% of the people out there, if you took the tape measure to your limbs and measured, there would probably be an imbalance between your left and right sides. Most people there is. Usually it's only a slight difference, but in some cases it may be visibly noticeable without even measuring. So, that, that's kind of normal. Now, what you can do is try and do single limb exercises as much as possible. And if, if you want a full single limb workout, I have a playlist on the on my Total Fitness Bodybuilding YouTube channel. Just go to the main page, open up the playlists, and there's one called Single Limb Training. And it covers single limb exercises for all your major muscle groups. So you can follow that. There's a, there's a chest workout there, plus there's back workout, shoulder workout, arms, legs, you know, the whole body's covered there. Uh, so that's one resource uh, that you want to focus on. But realize that even if you do single limb training and you do it over a prolonged period of time, you may never fully balance this out, right? Because like we just have these genetic tendencies. Like if you are right-handed, I mean, regardless of how much training you do, chances are you're going to be stronger with your right hand than your left hand always it's just you, you're that's your dominant side and the same applies with the legs same applies with all the major muscle groups you usually, we usually have a dominant side so even if with the best of training you may never fully develop balance and proportion between both sides and sometimes you look at like even top level bodybuilders like if you, you look at old pictures of arnold back in the day his right arm was bigger than his left you know jay cutler when he was competing he's I think in his case, it might have been the left side bigger than the right, but I, I'm not 100% sure. But if you look at the pictures, like his one leg was noticeably bigger than the other leg, one arm noticeably bigger than the other arm. And, and you'll see this with a lot of people and even top level bodybuilders who are doing everything in their power to balance things out and who are have genetics, you know, the elite world class genetics. And even at that level, they still have some imbalances. 
So you may never fully uh, balance it out, but you can do your best to minimize those imbalances. And that's done through single limb training. All right, let's see what else we have. Um, Martino Costa saying, hey, Lee, greetings from the Netherlands. Huh, that's cool. We've got, a, we've got an international audience joining us today. Stuart, uh, Stuart Sankey, how can I get to 10 chin-ups quicker? I've took four months so far. I can only manage three. Still, if you can do three chin-ups, and I mean... If this is like within your first four months of working out and you can do three chin-ups, that's good. I mean, I know people who've been training for years and can't do a chin-up or a pull-up. Uh, so just focus on the progress. But as far as improving that, there's a, a lot of things that you can do. One is doing negatives where you actually – in fact, I, I tell you what, rather than – I want to try and get through a few more questions here because I know I've been taking a long time for some of them. Go on YouTube right now and do a search for um, Lee Hayward pull-ups for beginners or something like that. <laughs> I, can't, I can't remember the exact name, but I have a couple of videos showing some strategies of how to improve your pull-ups in, in video. And I actually show the exercises and demonstrate them on the video, which will be a lot better and more beneficial for you than me just talking about it. So do a search for Lee Hayward pull-ups and on YouTube, and you should find those videos. And again, that, that will point you in the right direction and actually give you some exercises that you can start implementing the next time you go to the gym. So uh, give those a go, Stuart, and uh, send me an email. Let me know how they work for you. Again, Lee Hayward pull-ups. Just search that in YouTube, and you'll find those videos. Okay. Da -da -da -da. Azim is joining us. Azim is a regular. He, I think... I, I think he's tuned into pretty much every live chat that I've done within the last year or so. So again, kudos to you, Azim. He says, do you still read bodybuilding books? If so, which ones did you read? Why? Any recommendations? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I. what are some of the books that I've read recently? I'm just looking here. I haven't really read a lot of new bodybuilding books, but I do have a lot of some classic ones. And I, and a lot of times what I find, like I, I'm online, you know, watching videos and, and studying courses and stuff like that and, and reading blogs and all that stuff. So I get a lot of stuff online. Um, what are like some good books? This one was a classic one, big beyond belief. I got this. This was one of my first books that I got back in copyright 1994 and I got it in the late 90s as well this one had a big impact on my training back in the day big beyond belief Tom Platts was one of the co-authors of it Leo Costa jr. Uh, there's also another gentleman uh, Russ Horns they, they three of them wrote this book this one had a big impact I, I followed this and made some really good gains had a big impact on my training um, another cool one that I liked Dinosaur Training by uh, Brooks DeCubic. If, if you're into old school, hardcore, like dungeon gym type training, uh, you'll really like this. If you're into power and strength, uh, you, you'll like this, right? It's, it's kind of like really raw and uh, old school. So uh, it's a fun, I, that had a big impact on my training back in the day as well. Um, here's some other ones that I got here. I like old school stuff. I really do. I like old school stuff. Uh, Vince Gironda program, right? This one, um, awesome. This one was published by Critical Bench, actually, and it was a compilation of some of the best material from Vince Gironda covering diet strategies, workout strategies, whatever. That's That was an awesome one as well. Uh, what are some other ones? Super Squats. Another one that had big impact on my training. I made some of my best gains ever following the 20 rep squat program back in the day. As that's that's another cool one. I, I like old school stuff. Uh, if you want the mindset of bodybuilding, like the, the inner game, this one, uh, Iron Mind. Uh, it's a stronger minds, stronger bodies. I'm trying. Uh, the reason I turned it around because it's all backwards there. <laughs> that one. This kind of like covers the mindset and it's all like little short stories of 
how you can mentally overcome different challenges and that that you're going to deal with when it comes to bodybuilding, powerlifting, strength training, all, all the shit that you're going to deal with in, in your fitness journey. There's it's like a series of short stories uh, and sharing how people overcame challenges. Uh, so I, I like that one. Uh, what else have we got here? Got a few books up here, as you can tell. For those of you who are into strength training, super training, another classic one. Right, this is more into weightlifting, powerlifting type of stuff. It's it's a very deep read, right? It's it's not it's not a fun read, but if if you like deep, <laughs> that's that's a good one. I'm gonna... What else have we got? Uh, I think that that's. Uh, da, da, da. Those are pretty. Oh, here's another one. I, I'm going to give a shout out to this one too. It, it actually here's another one. Uh, I got a bunch here. Extreme muscle enhancement. Uh, that's another one that I really like. Right, some different. Really goes into bodybuilding and and th like the competition side of things and some different training and nutrition strategies for competition. So that's a good one. I also have another book that was a pre contest. I've got a lot of shit, man. Sorry, I could I could go on and on, right? I mean, and this is just stuff that I have in this little tiny shelf here. Like downstairs, I have a whole bookshelf full of books, and out in the living room, I got another shelf full of books, right? I could almost do my own little Ty Lopez thing, you know, and show all my books. The only thing I don't have is my Ferraris in a garage. Uh, but yeah, I got a lot of books. So those are a few cl classic reads, right there. E e either one of those would be a. Uh, would be an education in itself. So let's move on. Uh, all right, got five five six says Lee, big fan. Uh, I need to be able to run one and a half miles in under fourteen minutes in about three weeks. All right, not cutting it close, any are we? Um, I can barely run one point five miles in under twenty minutes right now. I've been neglecting cardio. Any advice? Ouch. Um, ouch. Like three weeks. Like That's not much time at all to give your, I mean, that's that, like, if you look at percentage wise, that's a huge improvement. That's maybe like a 30% improvement in three weeks. Uh, whew. Yeah. What, I mean, I, I'm not a running coach, so I'm not the best person to 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 offer advice on this. But some strategies that I would probably recommend. All right, again, disclaimer: I'm not a running coach. You should go seek out someone who is a running coach to help you with this. Right? I, I but uh, I remember reading stories about Roger Bannister. You know, the man who crushed the 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 the. the mile, what was it, the four-minute mile or whatever it was back in the day. Um, how he broke it down was he did it in phases. So if you need to run 1.5 miles, I'd probably break it up. I mean, let's just do like half-mile breakups. Focus on running half miles at a time. So half mile for as hard as you can. Half miles for as hard as you can. And break that up and then uh, on your alternate that with longer, easier runs at uh, you know a slower pace to build up your overall conditioning and work capacity. So the shorter high intensity runs, which would probably be like a half a mile, would be uh, you, you push yourself hard, right? To try and, and really get a good time. Obviously that time that you're gonna do for the half mile run is gonna be f much slower than you would for the entire 1.5 mile run. And then you alternate that with the, the longer duration, uh, lower intensity runs to build up your overall endurance and work capacity and alternate that. And then, of course, you also need to factor in rest time. I mean, three weeks, like shit, you don't have much time, right? I mean, I wish I, if, if you came back and said three months, yeah, we could plan out a, an actual strategy that would probably work. But three weeks, see, the problem you have is if you try and push yourself too hard, you're probably going to end up straining and pulling something or shin splints or knee or joint pain or hip pain, and that might even slow you down more. So you really have to be careful with this because you don't, you're not allowing time to build up your cardio and conditioning gradually like you should um yeah i'm, I'm just going to move on because i'm probably going to confuse you more than i'm helping you again go talk to a running coach and see if they can pull a rabbit out of a hat for this one
but three weeks is much too short. I mean, I, I get this a, a similar type of question. Like a lot of times, people say, "Hey, I'm going on vacation in three weeks. How how do I you know lose like thirty pounds in three weeks? What do I do?" And I like, man, you, you can't do it. You, you right? As like a woman saying, "Hey, I want to have a baby in thirty days. How do I get pregnant? And have a baby in thirty days? You can't do it. It's physically impossible, right? You know, certain things take time, and <laughs> it's the same with your fitness." Right, you you can't speed up the uh, you know you can't speed up nature. All right, moving on. Uh, Pervez asking for a safe drug for cutting. Well, I'm not a big advocate of drugs. In fact, I don't recommend using drugs. Period. But if you're looking for a fat burning supplement, uh, one that I have used with good success over the years is the ephedrine and caffeine green tea stack. And I mean, technically that is a drug. I mean, ephedrine and caffeine are drugs, but it's not like illegal drugs. Well, at least it's not in most places, but I have a video It's called uh, just do a search for like Lee Hayward ECA stack or Lee Hayward. Um, my favorite fat burning stack or something like that. I, I, a video I put together a couple of years ago, but I go into detail about this and, and share how I've used it myself when getting ready for competitions and how it helps with uh, fat loss. So do a search for that and you should be able to find it. It's up on YouTube right now. All right. Fair Dincom. Again, if I'm butchering your name, I do apologize. But uh, says, what do you think about doing curls with a 10 second up and a 10 second down? That's a very slow tempo. And if you use a slow tempo like that, you are going to get a lot of time under tension and muscle activation. But, you know, it isn't necessarily better or, or worse. You know, I mean, you, you can make gains using any, any tempo for that matter. But if you're looking to change it up, right, changing up your tempo is just another variable that you can change, right? You can change your sets, you can change your reps, you can change your exercises, you can change your workout split, or you can change your tempo. So just think of it as another tool that you have for manipulating your workouts. And where tempo training like this can really help is if you're having trouble feeling a muscle working and, and you want to get more time under tension, doing super slow reps like that in really strict form is, is a good way to do it. So, you know, you, you can incorporate it for that. Uh, Jeffrey's asking, he says, do box squats damage your ACL? I've heard rumors that doing box squats can damage your ACL. Not if you lift within your means and you don't have any pre-existing injuries. Right? I mean, any exercise has the potential for injury. I mean, a, a squat has potential for injury, a box squat, a bench press, a deadlift. Like, every exercise out there has potential for injury. Uh, but if you lift within your means, warm up properly, uh, it's, it's no more dangerous than any other exercise. In fact, you know, well, it, it, it's still, I mean, squats are an advanced exercise to begin with, right? You know, so we're not going to say it's its the least risky of exercises. I mean, no, I mean, squats in general carry a certain degree of risk, but uh, it's no riskier than a regular squat, put it that way. All right, Ground 3D Flygon says, which is better, intermittent fasting or six small meals throughout the day? The main thing is your overall caloric intake throughout the day. That's the number one thing, right? Whether you're breaking it up in six meals, you're eating it in one meal, whatever, it comes down to the overall total throughout the day. That's You, you can't escape that, right? I mean, I've seen guys get shredded and, and build muscle eating six meals a day. I've seen guys get shredded and build muscle intermittent fasting. This is my practical take on it. If your main goal is building muscle, right, you want to fill out your frame with muscular body weight, multiple meals throughout the day is easier because you, you can eat smaller meals. It's easier to get more food in your system throughout the day when you're eating more frequently. That's where the whole six meals a day really came from is guys trying to bulk up. And even if you look at like babies who are growing, we feed them multiple times per day. Like we don't starve a baby all day long and then just give it one big meal at the end of the day right? Because the baby's stomach can't handle it. It would spit it all up, right? So we give them small, frequent me feedings throughout the day. You know, like babies, every hour or two, you know, they're, they're drinking milk or 
you know, sucking on mom's boob or whatever, right? You know, and even as they're they're young and they get into the toddler phase, they're still eating multiple small meals a day because their stomach just physically can't handle the volume of calories it needs in a, you know, in, in such a small window. So these multiple meat feedings throughout the day is better for people who are trying to bulk up, grow, and gain mass, right? It's easier to get more calories when you eat more often. Vice versa, if you're trying to lose weight and cut back on your calories, it's easier to restrict calories when you eat less often. So instead of eating uh, small meals, you can still eat big satisfying meals, just eat fewer of them so that your overall calorie intake at the end of the day is still puts you in a deficit. So th again, this is a very generic one size fits all type of answer because it depends on the individual, depends on their situation and everything else. You know, like for example, someone who's a, a diabetic and has blood sugar issues, they may need, you know, to have smaller, more frequent meals or someone who has digestive issues, you know, they may need a specific eating protocol for them. But for the average Joe, if you're bulking, eat more often. If you're cutting, eat less often. Again, it's a generic one size fits all type of uh, answer here but it's, it's what I would recommend. Oh, gilly dokily guys, I'm going to get ready and clue it up. We are, uh, you know, we're getting close to the uh, end of the hour. Well, we're off well over the hour. I always go over an hour, but we're almost up to, uh, what we got, about an hour and 20 minutes or so there now. How, how long is this? Let me just see if I can see it on the, uh, where was it? Does it say how long we've been going? I think it's been an hour and 20 minutes-ish. Can't see the timer anywhere. Okay. Uh, what I'll do is I've been doing this last few chats. I jump to the end of the chat, right? The last question of the day. I jump to the end of the chat and see what's the the last one. So let me see what we got here. Um, let's see. Uh, 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 some comments there. All right, we got a couple of questions here. This one, um, trying to, what's it saying? This one, thank you, very humble. I, one of my shoulders hurt when I train, how to avoid it. Sorry, my English is not my first language. This one's from Iraq. Uh, okay, your shoulders hurt when you train in I have a shoulder warm-up routine that I want you to check out. It's one of, I've posted it fairly recently, but again, if I have a few shoulder warm-up routines, but go to my most recent videos. Uh, do a search for Lee Hayward, rotator cuff, uh, that should help. But the shoulders are very vulnerable because it's, it's a small joint and it's a very mobile joint, you know, because you have to be able to move your arm and all this massive range of motion. Whereas you look at the elbow, right? It, it does one thing. It just bends one direction. You know, the knee bends one direction, right? You know, shoulder is this 360 degree mobility joint because, it, you know, it's a ball and socket that can rotate. And because it's so flexible and mobile, it opens up the door to a lot of injury, especially if you're training it hard and heavy. So you really need to, to take care of your shoulders, right? So warming up the shoulders prior to every single workout, regardless if it's an upper body day or not, I always do it. And for that matter, if you have a shoulder injury, you can even do like a shoulder warm up at home throughout the day just to get mobility and, and, and blood flow throughout the shoulders. You know, little things like rotator cuff rotations, you know, uh, uh, external rotations, some rubber band pull aparts and, and different types of things, you know, like even Bradford presses with a, with a broomstick, you know, arm circles, all these kind of things can uh, definitely help just to improve mobility and circulation and flexibility throughout your shoulders. So if you have shoulder problems now, more frequent movement, and th this applies to any place you have joint pain or problems, more frequent movement, light, low intensity frequency. That's what you want to focus on. And like, try to not cause yourself any pain or discomfort, but do frequent movement to get more blood flow and circulation and mobility and, and, and all that into the muscles and into the joints. The more often you do it, it's like greasing the groove. This is what they say is you're greasing the groove. So you, instead of like only hitting shoulders like once a week at the gym and then you got 
all, all the rest of the week where you're not doing anything. Try and do a little bit every single day just to keep those muscles loose and mobile and limber. And that will help speed up recovery and just make you feel better in general. So that, uh, that's my uh, two cents worth on the shoulders. And again, if you want some specific exercises, go on YouTube and do a search for Lee Hayward shoulder warm up or Lee Hayward uh, rotator cuff. You know, there's, there's several videos there covering some good exercises that you can do. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to clue it up. Thank you so much for tuning in. It was a fun chat. I enjoyed it. Glad I got the audio figured out. <laughs> All right. So hopefully this came through extra loud and clearer today. And as always, I will have the replay posted up within the next 24 hours with the timestamp. So if you want to jump back and forth throughout the video chat and see that, you can certainly do so. And if you would like some help, if you have some questions and you would like to have a chat to basically brainstorm strategies that are right for you, because a lot of the stuff I cover here, it's just it, it's generic advice, right? I mean, now I know for 80 percent of the people out there, generic advice is good enough. But in some cases, you need something more specific than generic. So if you feel that you need some more specific help for your individual situation, send me an email and I'll be more than happy to chat with you offline. So again, leeh at leehayward.com. Uh, send me an email and uh, we'll take it from there. So have yourself a great weekend and I'll talk to you next week. Take care. Over and out. <laughs>